it's Wednesday night, and we're we're studying through the Old Testament. I have really been thinking on the Old Testament. How can we get through this? Every chapter, I may not go into detail because when you're going into the law, uh, you're going into the daily laws of, I call them civil laws of the people, and sometimes there'll be a repetition of uh, measurements of curtains and measurements, how many cubits uh, a certain particular uh, part of the tabernacle is, and I might give you some of those measurements, but We'll never get through the law by going through every verse. So I'm going to give you an overall picture of some of the chapters. And I have really thought about this for some time. Uh, You've heard us talk about the shadows of the Old Testament being the shadows of the very image. Old Testament is a shadow. In fact, let's go over and read that. Let's read a couple of verses on the shadows. Over here in Hebrews 10, we have worked our way through Genesis, come up to Exodus. Exodus is the exiting of Israel from Egypt. Exodus has to do with exit, and exit means out, and they're going to go out of Egypt. And we've worked our way through Moses' birth in the second chapter of Exodus, and then we've gone on up through the ten plagues, there in the first part of Exodus up through the 12th chapter, and that is where you have the 10th plague, which is the death of the firstborn in Egypt. And the Jews call that the Passover because the death angel, God says, when I see the blood, the death angel would pass over your house and will not kill the firstborn, the ones that have the blood over the doorpost. Then we went on through that uh, 14th chapter where that, Pharaoh followed Israel down into the Red Sea and Pharaoh's armies were drowned. And then they come out and Moses gets to the mountain of God in the 18th chapter. He goes into the mountain, goes up into the mountain, the 19th chapter. In the 20th chapter, he brings down the Ten Commandments written on tables of stone. And I've and I have concluded that what I need to do in teaching Old Testament Wherever we go, instead of rushing through certain what I would call very important parts, what I'm going to do is take the parts of the Old Testament or the shadows, and I'm going to connect everything I can, well, not everything, connect a lot that I can to the New Testament very image. And what I'm going to try to do is go into a lot of detail about certain very prominent parts of the uh, Old Testament. Uh, And we find that the Bible says there in Hebrews 10 and 1, in 10 and 1, that the law having a shadow of good things to come. Now, to come means means in the New Testament. In the New Testament. And that's why in the New Testament, Israel is the church. Church is the word ecclesia, E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A. And ecclesia being the word church, it is a construction of ek, and like we said, that we get our word E-X, X, or exit, which means out, and kaleo. Kaleo means to call. We've been called out of this world to live righteously. Uh, It's sometimes you can connect the word church with the word called. It comes to my mind in 1 Peter. Look at it real quick. In 1 Peter... The second chapter, and you have to learn to look at the Bible like this. When you find the word called, and it's a reference to the believers being called unto something, that's the church being called out of the world to live righteously. And when he says here in 
First Peter, the second chapter and verse. I've read this and, and pointed this out, but I'm wondering if anybody ever caught it. He says here in verse 20, For what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, if someone persecutes you for your sin, you shall take it patiently. But if when you do well, instead of doing evil, and you suffer for it, you take it patiently. This is acceptable with God, for even hereunto were ye called. Here's what you were called to, to suffer for doing righteousness. Hereunto were you kaleo, so we're called out to do right. We're called to this. And I'm not going to go further into this because it goes, anytime you find here unto where you called, or when Romans 8 and 28 says, For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called. Well, the called, the reason they put the called, the is not actually in the text. But how many called are there? There's one church, and it actually, usually, whenever you do not have a definite article in, uh, before a, a noun, and called here would be a noun, if you don't have a definite article, usually the indefinite article is understood. But there is not a called, there's only one called, this is why the translators put the called, since the only called is the church. Right? And how many churches are there? One. The church is the body of Christ. So when you find that word called, look at it that way. Now, go back over here to the 10th chapter. The law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things... It's not the very image. The shadow is not the image. Image, of course, is the word icon. It means representation. The shadow is not the true representation. The image, the icon, in the New Testament, this is the real. The spiritual is the real. The spiritual. This is why whenever whenever I put the... Uh, the uh, the temple or the tabernacle up on the board, and here's the veil and the Ark of the Covenant, and everything that we're studying out of the Old Testament, we're going to see. We've already seen that the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant is our hearts over here because the law is written on fleshy tables of the heart over here. It was written on tables of stone over here. The Ark, was <clears throat> the Ark, <clears throat> the Ark of the Covenant was sprinkled over here. Our hearts are sprinkled over here. And the prayers of the saints are the, according to the Revelation, the 4th chapter and 5th chapter, the prayers of the saints go up as a sweet-smelling savor to God. And the table of showbread on the north side of the outer sanctuary, we being many are one bread and one body. And the bread was also kept inside the Ark of the Covenant, and that's a picture, or the manna, and that is a picture of the daily bread because in the daily bread is also on this on this table of showbread and the candlesticks is a picture of the church there in revelation that first chapter that last verse and this this brazen sea is a picture of the baptism of the living water of Christ which is the truth and this altar this brazen altar is a picture of the daily cross as well as the cross of Christ so what we're doing is we're looking at these shadows. And can never with those sacrifices, all these sacrifices that were offered over here, can never with these sacrifices, which they offered every year by year continually, make the comers, the people that came there, it never made them mature, teleos, teleotes, never made them perfect, did it? It did not increase them it was their obedience. What were these for? 
They were to obey God because everything pointed to New Testament church, church, prayers, hearts of the saints. And we are God's house. That was called the house of God. And the Bible says, and uh, we are the bread. Our prayers here are the altar. And the church is the seven church, the seven candlesticks, like we said. He said, for then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshipers once purged would have no more conscience of sins if they had have taken their sins away. Everything they did over here was to point here into the New Testament. So what I'm going to keep doing is pointing, taking everything over here, the shadows, and pointing over here. Shadow is the word skia. And I'm going to be as detailed as I can. Huh? Well, okay, let me do that. All right. Boy, that's dark, isn't it? Now, what I'm going to do is take the the shadows and point as much as I can over here. We know that they had a high priest over here. We know that we're the temple of God. We know that we're the house of God, which was the inner sanctuary. This is our hearts, the Ark of the Covenant. That's the refined church, the candlesticks, and so forth. And what we're going to do is... They had a high priest over here. Who is the high priest over this temple over here? Huh? Well, but what was he called? Melchizedek. He held the office of Melchizedek. And then he sprinkles our hearts with his blood. And he's not only the high priest, but he's the sacrifice. And he's the high priest and he sprinkles and he's the king over here. And he's the king because he lives in our hearts. And remember that kingdom of God, kingdom of God was a term for Israel. And any time Matthew says the kingdom of God was likened to, and all through Matthew he's saying this in parables, he'll say the kingdom of God was likened to. That's the church is like unto. And we'll go through a bunch of those along the way. Now, and then he says, but those in those sacrifices... There is a remembrance, again, made of sins every year. It is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. And what is the body? The church. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings, and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure in them. What does he mean God didn't have pleasure in the sacrifices? The only he, thing he had pleasure in was in their obedience to these sacrifices because they were going to point to Christ. Every offering that was made daily throughout, sometimes they would have seven lambs and bullocks and they were going to purify the inner sanctuary. All these lambs, they had a lamb in the morning, every morning at around six at sunup and every evening about six at sundown and they had a daily lamb and that's us. We're lambs to the slaughter daily and they had a, and they had a goat on the Day of Atonement, offered on that every year, the tenth day of the seventh month, and that's a picture of Christ. And all of these are pictures pointing to Jesus. But it goes on to say that He is the one offering as opposed, notice this, as opposed to all these sacrifices that He speaks of in the first four verses that it's not possible for them to take away sin, then He goes into the one sacrifice. And he says, Then said he, Lo, verse 9, I come to do thy will, O God. And he takes away the first covenant. Over here. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. Colossians 2.14. Blotting out all these rituals and fulfilling it in the true temple of God, which temple we are. 
This is how you study the Bible. Look at the Old and the New Testament. Then he says, uh, Then said I, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. What if I said, He takes away the shadow, that he may establish the very image, or the New Testament spiritual. We see that? Is that pretty simple, isn't it? That he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Not the blood of bulls and goats as he's talking about early in the chapter because that doesn't take away sins. If you'll notice, he points directly to Christ in this chapter from the sacrifice of blood of bulls and goats and points to the true sacrifice, doesn't he? And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices can never take away sins. He's saying these priests over here offering these sacrifices, the only thing they were for was to show Israel's obedience because these were all going to point to Christ and point to us here in this true temple of God. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering his body on the cross, he had perfected forever teleotes or teleosis or teleo, forever them that are sanctified. <coughs> Whereof the Holy Ghost also is witness to us, for after that he had said before, Now this is the covenant that I will make with my people after those days, saith Lord, I'll put my laws into their hearts. In their minds I'll write them. And then he said, We enter in by new and living way into the Holy of Holies, not by the blood of a goat, but by the blood of the Lamb of God, or actually by the blood of the goat, which was Christ, and his blood is sprinkled upon our hearts. Now look over here in Colossians. In Colossians. And this goes with this Hebrews 10. In Colossians. The Bible says in verse 8, Beware lest any man spoil you, or carry you away into captivity. Sulagogeo means to seduce away, like booty off of a ship. Beware lest any man spoil you, or carry you away into darkness through philosophy, man's philosophy, philos, sophos, an affection for man's wisdom, P-H-I-L-O-S. Uh, we may have to just keep changing. Philos, sophos. Philos means an affection for man's wisdom that will carry you away into darkness through vain deceit or empty apate, which is a word to deceive or carry away, after the tradition of men and after the rudiments of this world <coughs> and not after Christ. That word tradition is paradosis. You remember that? Man's, man's tradition, and I believe it's a reference to the halakha of the Pharisees. And after the rudiments, stoichion, S-T-O-I-C-H-E-I-O-N, S-T-O-I-C-H-E-I-O-N, the orderly arrangement in the stoichion, they called, the Jews called all of the rituals of the tabernacle stoichion. He says, that'll lead you away. Uh, and not after Christ. And then he says down here, we're circumcised with a spiritual circumcision made without hands in verse 11. Well, to be a Jew, you had to be circumcised. And we're buried with him in baptism. If the circumcision is spiritual, the baptism here is spiritual, and it is. It's made without hands. Remember, to be a proselyte, you had to be circumcised and washed in water and offer an offering of two turtle doves, two turtle doves. And that was a process of entering into Israel as a Gentile. This is a Gentile church we're talking to. 
buried with him in baptism, wherein we are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. You being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. I believe I'm, I have preached on blotting out the handwriting of ordinances more than any preacher alive in the world. And I never even heard anybody that understood what it meant. Because unless you go studying the rituals and how something was blotted out uh, that was against us, which was contrary to, to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. The way the, the law was not done away with. Only the rituals of the law. There in Isaiah, the first chapter, God says, I will away with your sacrifices. You won't obey me. You'll offer sacrifice in Jerusalem but you're not obedient to my word. I want obedience. Well, isn't faith in the New Testament obedience? Well, sure it is. Faith cometh by hearing, and hear and obey the same basic word. So, it's always, faith is always obedience, isn't it? If you believe God, if they believe God, they're supposed to do what he says. If he says offer sacrifices and sprinkle this Ark of the Covenant, they're supposed to do it. If he says to give our bodies a living sacrifice in the New Testament, we have to do that, don't we? <coughs> there is no faith without obedience. We have to be obedient to the faith. That's what the Bible says continually. If you believe something, you do it. Believe in faith are the same word. One's the verb, the other's the noun. Then he says, And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly. What principalities and what powers? The principalities that ruled the principalities that ruled the word principality is the word RK uh, it means principal rule whatever is ruling spoiled these the thing that ruled them in the Old Testament was these rituals and even Isaiah said God said I don't want your rituals anymore you won't be obedient to me what are the rituals for if you're not obedient what good does it do to go to some church and listen to some preacher preach some dull message if nobody there is obeying God. It don't do any good. And then he says, Let no man therefore judge you in Jewish meats. None of the dietary laws of the Jews, Colossian church, or in Jewish drink offerings, or in respect of any holy days of the Jews, since we're nailing these to the cross, Doing away with one contract, I'm not saying it for the people here at Grace and Truth. I'm saying it just in case somebody here hasn't heard me say it on the DVD or on the Internet. To do away with one contract, you would take the two contracting parties, original contracting parties, out in public. You'd have two witnesses that was privy to the original contract, and you would say, is everyone agreement we're going to blot out this original contract? They'd say yes, and they'd drive a nail through it, very much like our taking a notary stamp and it held up in their courts of law to drive the nail through it. That's what it's talking about. The only thing that was blotted out was the rituals, not the law. Do we make the, void the law through faith? Yea, we established the law, that last verse of the third chapter of Romans. We established the law. All the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, Thou shalt love, agape, walk in the commandments of God. Love thy neighbors, I say. I was raised in a Baptist preacher's home, and if you ever said obey God or obey the law, they all went berserk on you. We don't believe in salvation by works. You ever heard some preacher say that? My father would say that. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Not of works, lest any man should boast. And they would ignore the next verse in verse 10 of chapter 2 of Ephesians. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Not in rituals, not in works of self-righteousness, but in works of God working in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. That used to, I couldn't understand that as a kid they would say that. We don't believe in works here. Well, I know you don't. And then he says, don't let any man judge you in holy days. That would be, Literal Passover, literal Feast of Weeks or Pentecost. 
which came 50 days after, literal Day of Atonement, literal uh, Feast of Tabernacles, literal all the festivals that went from March, April, or Nisan to Tishri, September, October, and all their festivals. Don't let any man judge you, Colossian Gentile Church, in any of this, or any new moons which came at the first of every one of their months from from uh, Tish, Nisan to Tishri, the seven months of their ecclesiastical calendar, or of any Sabbath days. Don't let anybody tell you you have to be keeping any Sabbaths. That's what he's telling this Colossian Gentile church. People will argue for a Saturday Sabbath, and we believe the Sabbath is every day because we rest in all the things that God is doing. Then in reference to all of these rituals, he says, which are a shadow, a skia. All the rituals have been nailed to the cross. They were a shadow. But is the Sabbath nailed? No. Are the holy days nailed? No. All the rituals are nailed to the cross. But we keep them all spiritually over here. I did a spiritual Sabbath series. It's on the internet if you want to watch it. I did a spiritual Passover series. It's on the internet if you want to watch it. It wasn't eating crackers and drinking grape juice, which are a shadow of things to come. But notice what he says. But, here's a conjunction, throwing the following sentence in opposition to what's just been said. But the body is of Christ, the church is the exact opposite of this over here. Well, not opposite. He's, it's the parallel in the New Testament. But the church, as opposed to all the rituals over here, the church is Christ. That's what he's saying. And there's one body, isn't there? One body in the body is the church. Colossians 1.18 and 1.24. Now, so we're talking about shadows. Let's go back over here to... Exodus. We've been going through some things in Exodus. I'm going to get to. I've got so many things I want to give to you on this. But we've been talking about. I don't even quite know where to take up where we left off. We've been talking about. i got so many things I want to bring out. And what we're going to do is keep talking about these shadows and images. Now, we've worked our way through. We've gotten to the 25th chapter where the Lord gives instructions. 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 To build. All this right here. In everything that they're instructed to build, the brazen altar, brazen altar, everything here, the sea, the brazen sea, and the veil, and the Ark of the Covenant, the candlesticks, the table of showbread, and the altar of incense. Every bit of this is going to have its counterpart in the spiritual over here. And these priests and these Levites, they had a high priest over here, but he was over the other priests, and they were all Levites. And the Bible says that Israel there in the 16th chapter of Exodus, that Israel is a kingdom of priests, but everybody's not a high priest. So that would be us. That would be us, the church. And what kind of offering do we offer? Our bodies are living sacrifice daily. And we give our bodies by saying truth. Saying truth, and people want to crucify us for saying Christmas is pagan, Easter is pagan, God doesn't love everybody, and baptism is blood, not water, and Jesus wasn't eating crackers and drinking grape juice and calling it communion. He's eating the last Passover 
and that was blotted out, and now we're in a spiritual Passover. And Jesus is the priest. He's Melchizedek. He sits in the seat of Melchizedek. Spelled with a C in the New Testament. Spelled with a K. The ending is K in the Old. Now, we've talked about how that the candlesticks, the candlesticks is a, it's a hexagonal shaped thing. When you view it from the top, you got six candlesticks on the outside, equidistant. We've talked about how it was a six-spoke wheel. And we've talked about how that the Syrian war chariots were wheels in wheels. That's how they were made, the Babylonian war chariots, excuse me, and that they were six spokes. And we've talked about the eye. And there's seven points on that, including the center candlestick. And we've talked about the human eye is a wheel in a wheel, a wheel in a wheel, and that there's seven points that, that are in here in the sense that, that when, you, when light goes through a prism, that it breaks off into seven colors, and light goes into the pupil of the eye. And we've also said that Israel was the apple or the pupil of God's eye there in Zechariah 2 and 8. And pupil is the word baba. The word apple is baba. It means pupil. And that's an opening in the eye where the light goes in. And then we've talked about how, how that the seven candlesticks are the eyes of the Lord. Eyes of the Lord there in Zechariah the fourth chapter. And we've talked about the seven candlesticks is the seven churches of Asia in the last verse of that first chapter of Revelation, seven churches of Asia. So the, the church or the seven churches, the eyes of the Lord. God's eyes go through the whole earth. I believe there is a direct connection between the candlesticks, the chariot wheels, and the human eye. Now, I'm not going to go through that again. If you want that, you can watch that on the Internet. Now, we've, let's go back over to... I'm going to try to finish up where I've gone to. Go back to Ezekiel. Ezekiel. And I'm, we're still in some of the shadows. We see the wheels and the wheels, and we have established that the wheels and the wheels in the first chapter of Ezekiel are Assyrian war chariots. They're coming in from the north, and the only way Babylon can come in to destroy Israel is from the north. That's because, say it again, that's because when Israel was attacked, any time you see all this brown area on a map, that's all desert. Nobody's going to attack Israel from Babylon. The green part is the traversal, traversable area. It's where you could travel. So the only way Israel can be attacked is from the north. You can't go across thousands of miles of uh, eight or 900 miles of desert to attack Israel. They'll come up from the north, that a whirlwind from the north, and, the, and those chariots were called whirlwinds. Now, we've established that's what the wheels and the wheels are, and we've established it because Ezekiel, Ezekiel is, and we're still in the shadows. Everywhere you go in the Old Testament, you're going to have shadows all over the place. And finding all the shadows is it's a lifetime experience, and you're not going to find them all. Uh, nobody's going to find all the shadows. You'll see them constantly. The more you, I keep saying this, the more information you put into your head, the more you see. Don't try to figure things out before you get information in your mind. And the more you put in your head, the slower you're going to come to a conclusion. I had people ask me questions. Mary will ask me questions. I want uh, I want you to explain this to me, but I don't want but about four or five sentences. And I, she'll ask me the question. I say, I can't answer that. Yes, you can. I said, not with four or five sentences, I can. Uh, just, well, just give me a couple of quick sentences. I can't give you anything even beginning to be clear with two or three sentences. The longer you study... I don't know how to even put this. I started to say the more complicated God's Word gets. It's not. The more it untangles. 
But the more it untangles, it's like it's like getting a fishing line tangled up. The more you get it untangled, the longer it gets and the more unraveled it gets and it's spreading out everywhere. When you begin to see, if you're trying to figure out the Bible and you got three or four little avenues here, wait till you get all these other avenues out here and you learn for 25 or 30 years and you, and you, you think of one thing over here and it brings to mind this over here or it brings to mind this over here. Constantly when I'm teaching, these things are coming to my mind just through years of study. And do I think I know a lot about this book compared to what there is to know? No, I don't believe that. The more you learn, the more you're going to know you don't know. Mike says that about mathematics. He'll say, the more you learn about math, the more you know you don't know about it. I know enough to know nobody will ever know a lot about the Bible. I'm talking about what there is to know. I've said this before. Do you actually think there's a Greek scholar out there that knows every all the parsing on one of these pages, just one of these pages? There's no such thing. How about every page? Huh? You want to get into every page? Do you actually think a Greek scholar can look at all of this and tell you what all of it means? He can't without looking it up. When I say Greek scholar, the word scholar just means learner. Did you know that? <laughs> it doesn't mean an expert. There's no such thing as a Greek and a Hebrew expert. They all have different opinions when you're studying these things. I've learned that studying Greek writers and Hebrew writers. And well, so-and-so says this and such-and-such says this and such-and-such says this and they're all disagreeing. And sometimes I feel like I've got a better ability if I'm analytical to understand than what they're saying. Well, that sounds arrogant, Jim Brown. No. You have to learn to be very objective. And don't think you have all the answers. And there's no open and shut case for all the answers of the Scripture. Now, we've worked our way through Ezekiel. We saw the wheels and wheels there in the first chapter, and we saw what they were about. They were war chariots because God is condemning Israel all through this book, and he kept saying, I will not pity. You did all these evil things. You went after all these idol gods. Remember, Ezekiel is prophesying in the neighborhood of 597 to 594 in that neighborhood because he was carried away into Babylon in the 597 B.C. deportation. To deport means to force someone to be removed. Well, Israel was removed over to Babylon. Here's the Mediterranean Sea. Here's Israel here. And they were moved to Babylon. There's three deportations, one in 605 B.C., one in 597, and one in the final deportation, 586, was the total destruction of southern Judah. Northern Israel has been destroyed in 722 B.C. So Israel is completely wiped out in 596. This was a military siege upon Israel, and they were destroyed. And, and Jerusalem was burnt to the ground. So they were in captivity for 2,600 years till May of 1948. Now Ezekiel is prophesying in the second captivity, and God is picking him up in visions and showing him what's going to be happening in 586 B.C. He's showing Ezekiel the destruction some ten years earlier. He's showing him what's going to happen and why it's going to happen. And there's some key things here. There's a couple of key verses you should remember. When I think of Ezekiel, I think of that first chapter, The Wheels and Wheels. And I think of this verse 6 of chapter 2. He tells Ezekiel, Remember this verse, Thou son of man, be not afraid of these men, their rebellious against God, their impudent children, from verse 4, their rebellious nation, from verse 3, talking about southern Judah, neither be afraid of their words, in verse 6, though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dost dwell among scorpions, be not afraid of their words. Always remember, a scorpion 
is somebody who puts out false doctrine. These scorpions here are the same as the scorpions in Revelation, the ninth chapter. Same thing. Look at that real quick. Here's the shadow. Here's the very image. Look at Revelation. I'm going to keep bringing these shadows together. Look over here. In Revelation, the ninth chapter, and I know a lot of you people know this here, and some of you may not have a hold of it as much as you think you do. In the ninth chapter, you got seven angels in the eighth chapter, have seven trumpets, and these are the seven spirits of the seven churches, seven angels of the seven churches. So this, if the seven angels are here, or the seven angels, angel angelos just means messengers. If the messengers of the seven churches are here, the church is here, isn't it? And then he says, and, and you see each one of these angels sounding a trumpet, and when the fifth angel sounded, I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given a key of the bottomless pit. Not bottomless pit, that's a terrible translation. Abusos, A-B-U-S-S-O-S. -S -S. It's a construction of bathos, B or bathizo, B-A-T-H-I-Z-O, which means a place of great intellectual depth, a great knowledge. That's the very word in the second chapter of 1 Corinthians when the Bible speaks of the deep things of God. When you place the alpha in front of a word as a negative particle, it negates the word. When you place the alpha privative in front of bathos or bathizo, it translates abusos. It means not a bottomless pit, but a place of no knowledge. Of no knowledge. Did those false teachers in Babylon have any knowledge of truth? No, they didn't have any knowledge. So these are going to be the same thing here. When he says you dwell among scorpions... You're dwelling in Babylon with a bunch of rebellious priests of God who didn't do what God said and they've been carried away into captivity. Ezekiel, you're dwelling among scorpions. Don't be afraid of their words. Scorpions preach words. Then he says, And he opened the bottomless pit, or the place of no knowledge, and there rose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the place of no knowledge. And there came out of the smoke locusts. Anytime you see locusts, think one thing in the Bible. Famine. Period. Good grief. Not helicopters. Don't think helicopters. That is so dumb. There's a locust. Somebody sent that to me. Gave it to me. Some more than where. It's a great big huge grasshopper. They would be four to six inches long. They would come in the hundreds of billions when Israel saw them coming, they could clean a field out in 15 minutes. Nothing left. Trees just, just hanging down with fruit, wheat, and here come the locusts, and it terrified Israel. You think locusts, you think famine. You think destruction of the food crop. That's what you think. And Hal Lindsay's got these as helicopters. That is so stupid. It's because he's never studied what locusts saw. He hasn't. There were four judgments in the Old Testament. The sword. What did I do with my pen that writes? Up here somewhere. The sword. Here's the four judgments. The sword, the famine, the pestilence, and the beast. The famine would come by locusts. No rain. God said, I'll make your heavens... Iron and your heavens brass and the earth will be iron. That means there'll be no rain till the earth will be so hard and crusty you can't grow anything in it. God said, that's my first judgment was famine. It'll come by locust or no rain. And Ezekiel and 
Elijah stood before Ahab and said, there'll be no rain for three and a half years, not a drop, no mist upon the ground in the morning. Three and a half years with no rain? What do you think would happen to America with no rain for three and a half years? There would be millions of people dying, wouldn't there? It would be unbelievable. The, the stores would be empty. He says, no rain. Now, all right. Back over here. Well, that was my pen. I folded it up. All right. Now, now back over here. He says, and the smoke, and there came out of the smoke locusts. Locusts look like smoke. They say that they would actually, in the hundreds of millions, it might be 20 miles long, maybe 10 or 15 miles wide, and it would block the sun, it would block the light, and it would be dark under that. It looked like smoke. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given the power as the scorpions of the earth have power. Scorpions. What was a scorpion in the second chapter of Ezekiel? It was a false teacher. As we've said, scorpion, scorpios. You've got a verb. In the Greek, you have a noun and you have a verb form. Scorpizo is the, is the verb form. And that's the word that Jesus used in the parable of the Good Shepherd in John 10. The hireling, the man who preaches for money, the false teacher, preaches for money. It allows the wolf, which is a false teacher, to come in and scatter the flock. Scatter is the word scorpizo, the verb form of scorpion. So when you find scorpions over there, what is this smoke? I've given this to you before. And when he says, it was commanded unto these scorpions that they should not hurt any grass of the earth, neither any green thing, he's saying, what he's saying is these are not literal locusts. They're like scorpions, and they're going to destroy the food crop like locusts destroyed the literal crop. And false teachers come from a place of no knowledge, don't they? What's amazing this can't be a hole in the ground because in that 11th chapter of Revelation, the beast rises out of the bottomless pit. The beast is Babylon, Persia, Greece that carried Israel away into captivity. Did they have any knowledge of truth? No. They came out of a place of no knowledge. The only people that had any knowledge of God throughout the Bible was Israel. That's all. That's all that ever have, has any knowledge of God, isn't it? In the New Testament, who has a knowledge of God? God's elect Israel. <clears throat> Nobody else where the beast ruled had any knowledge of God. But in the New Testament, it's not a literal beast. It's a world spiritual beast of self. Let us make us a name, isn't it? <clears throat> That's right. The, the scorpions, the way they're like locusts, locusts destroy food, literal, literal food. Scorpions destroy and hide. They hide under the cloud, destroy the law of God. And law is the word nomos. It means legal food for sheep, for animals, and we are sheep. And it means legal, prescribed food for us. So they, just, they destroy the spiritual crop. And locusts destroy the literal food, don't they? That's how they're like scorpions. Now, so is that where the scripture says, My people suffer from a lack of 
Of well, yeah, they said, well, when Hosea said that, it didn't mean they didn't have the knowledge of truth. They were unwilling to obey God. <clears throat> they, it's not like they didn't know. They did know. And look over here, back one more time in First, First Timothy. First Timothy. And I have, this equates with the scorpions in 1 Timothy 6 chapter. And the Bible says, if any man, talking about the doctrine of God not being blasphemed in chapter 6 in verse 1, not being hindered, if any man teach otherwise <clears throat> and consent not to wholesome words, Teach otherwise is the word hetero didaskaleo. H e t e r o h e t e r o d i d a s k a l e o. Didaskaleo is the word doctrine or instruction. And hetero means other. If anybody teaches any other doctrine, and consents not to Hugiano, H-U-G-I-A-I-N-O. That's the same word as sound. It means uncorrupt words. Uncorrupt words. It's also the same word as health in 3 John 2. Would you prosper and be in health? He doesn't mean physical health. He, he's talking about uncorrupt word of God. Of course, prosper is the word euhodos. And that is, are you a dao, which is, comes from you and hodos, means well way. And Jesus said, I am the way, and there's a narrow way and a broad way. So the well way, as, compo per, as uh, compared to the broad way, narrow is the word thelebo, and it means to go through tribulation, to be pressured on all sides. So health is that same word, that word, the, the word Hugiano is the same word as wholesome here. So he, this is the same thing as the scorpions here, and you'll see this. If a man consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine, the instruction that is according to godliness, verse 4 tells you about the scorpions. It doesn't use the word scorpion, but it uses all the description in the original text. The man who doesn't preach truth, he's proud to fao. He's blind. It comes from tuflos, which means to be slowly consumed by smoke with no fire. It means to blow smoke is what it means. So a man that's blind, he's blinded by, and the light is being the same way the locusts were blocking the sunlight from coming down through this cloud of locusts, the same way the scorpions are blocking the light of God from coming through to his people. Can you see that? This is very conceptual thinking. So he says, this man is proud. Proud would be a picture of the smoke in Revelation 9, wouldn't it? And he knows nothing. There's a picture of the bottomless pit, isn't it? Knowing nothing, the place of no knowledge, right? This very verse is a picture of the scorpions of Revelation 9. I have said this over and over and over. I've never had anybody comment to me on it. Has anybody gotten a hold of this? This verse is talking about the scorpions. Proud, consumed by smoke. That word consumed, proud, means self-conceited. The smoke that you're blowing in your own face is what's conceited in you and you can't see because of your pride. The Bible says the reason man can't see the truth, he's proud of himself. And he's got an opinion which is no knowledge. Knowing nothing, 
but doting about questions and strifes of words. I don't think that means that. That's just your opinion, Jim Brown. Where it cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmising, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth. Supposing that gain is godliness. Supposing, no midzo. No midzo is a form of nomos. Nomos is the Greek word law. And this means to legalize. They have legalized gain as godliness in their minds. They say if you got a lot of money, you must be godly. That makes Bill Gates the most godly man in America, doesn't it? Huh. It's a foolishness, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, all right. Now let's go back. How did I get to this? Scorpions. Oh, I want you to remember the second chapter of Ezekiel. With those scorpions, when you're going over here, to the scorpions of Revelation 9, and you're going to the proud know-nothing, destitute of the truth, that's false teachers, isn't it? That's scorpions consumed by smoke with no fire. Self-conceited. The Bible says conceit is what keeps a man from seeing, makes him blind. Now, there's another... There's some verses I want you to remember here in Ezekiel. Let's go back to Ezekiel. Always remember the scorpions of chapter 2. There's other verses, but there's some key verses when you're talking to people. That's a key verse. There's a key verse in the 8th chapter. In the 8th chapter is the first sunrise first service we have recorded in the Bible. Now, if you have a Thompson Chain Bible... It will have, and this is approximate time dates, right out beside chapter 8, it'll have 594 B.C. Well, that goes along with the fact that he was in the 597 second deportation. So, in 594 B.C., B.C. means before Christ, or before the common era, before the Christian era, you can... However, B.C.E., you say B.C.E., before the common era, before the Christian era. Some people say Christian. So B.C., this would be 594 years before Jesus is born, they're having a sunrise service. What does that have to do with Jesus? Nothing. What's a sunrise service for? To worship the sun. Now, God picks up Ezekiel, takes him over to Israel, and lets him see Israel worshiping the sun in a sunrise service 600 years before Jesus is crucified. Over 600 years before he's crucified. And people say, we're having a sunrise service because he rose from the dead on the first day of the week. At, well, the sunrise services were here for the sun. They also gave Jesus the birthday of the unconquerable son on December the 25th, didn't they? Because the, the winter solstice came on December the 21st, the longest nights of the year, and they said, we've got to pacify the sun god here at the Feast of Saturn in Babylon in uh, Rome, and we've got to offer sacrifices and burn all these bonfires to heat the earth up because the sun's burning out. Let's give the sun god Mithra a birthday on December the 25th, and they did. And we see the weep, women weeping for Tammuz. So this would equate with Mardi Gras, wouldn't it? This, they wept for Tammuz for 40 days, and that was, that was the... And they started on February the 15th, and since they had 360 days in their calendar, it would always end on a Tuesday every year, and they call that Fat Tuesday or Mardi Gras... Mardi Gras, which was the same thing as the seven-day festival. They started on the 7th of February, went through the, 5th, the 14th, and on the 15th, they would have this, that would, it would end on the 14th, excuse me. And then on the 15th would be Wednesday, which they called Ash Wednesday, 
and they'd weep for 40 days to March the 25th, which was the resurrection of Tammuz, and that was exactly nine months before December the 25th, and that was the day of Annunciation, so that nine months later they would have the birthday of the unconquerable son, December the 25th. And I don't have time to go through all that. But the point is, a sunrise service 600 years before Jesus in the 8th chapter of Ezekiel, that's very important to remember, along with the Scorpions chapter of chapter 2, along with the Wheel in the Wheel chapter of chapter 1. And then we see here, Then said he unto me, This is the Lord speaking unto Ezekiel. Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn, turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these women weeping for Tammuz. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. The Lord's house was the temple. That's what it was. Now the inner court, you had the courts of this. And this is why God is going to have Nebuchadnezzar come in and destroy Israel. Israel was rebellious against Nebuchadnezzar and they were rebellious against God. So God's going to put it in Nebuchadnezzar's heart to come in and destroy Israel and then he's going to hold Babylon. What amazes me, he's going to hold Babylon accountable for this, but it's not going to be in Nebuchadnezzar's generation. It's going to be on down about five generations later. He's going to hold Babylon accountable. I can't understand all that. So the inner court, you had, you had the courts of God's house. This is the temple of the Lord, and it was surrounded by this wall measurements. And, of course, here was the Ark of the Covenant and the candlesticks. And the priests ministered all around here. They did all of this work. Only one would go into the Holy of Holies on the tenth day of the seventh month. That was the Day of Atonement. All the rest of the priests did all the work around the temple, changing the table to showbread, uh, putting the incense on this and uh, lighting the lighting this uh, uh, altar here and having a fire on it and washing in this uh, brazen sea. They were doing all the work, and this was the inner court of the Lord's house. Solomon's porch was right here, and there was this big gate going in, and they called it a gate of pearl because it was a real shining brightness like a pearl. And there were 25 men standing here facing the east, worshiping the sun, facing the east, worshiping the sun as it came up on the horizon. And that's what it says here. And God is showing Ezekiel why he's going to destroy Israel. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, between Solomon's porch and this altar. They were standing somewhere in this neighborhood right here, 25 men facing the east. Well, excuse me, inside here, excuse me. Excuse me. Solomon's porch here. They were standing here in this, in this vicinity right here, right in this area, worshiping the sun with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east. The temple faced east. Faced east. And they worshipped the sun toward the east. Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is, is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land of Judah, southern Israel, with violence. They were killing their children, offering them in the, on the altars of Molech. And he even tells you about that in the 23rd chapter of this book. Look over here. Look in the 23rd chapter. 23rd chapter, he says uh, in verse 36, The Lord said, Moreover unto me, O son of man, wilt thou judge a whole lot? Now this word is a is a term for Israel, and a holy bar, which is a term also, it's a, a tent of Israel, 
and declare unto them their abominations that they have committed adultery and blood is in their hands. With their idols have they committed adultery and have also caused their sons whom they bear unto me to pass for them through the fire to devour them. They're killing their children in the fire to Moloch and you can see that in the 30th chapter of Isaiah. Moreover, this they have done unto me. They have defiled my sanctuary. In the same day have they profaned my Sabbaths. And when they had slain their children to their idols, talking about Israel, then they came the same day into my sanctuary and offered me a sacrifice. And lo, thus they have done in the midst of mine house. And furthermore, that ye have sent for a for men to come from far unto what a messenger was sent, and lo, they came for whom they, thou didst wash thyself, and paintest thine eyes, and deckest thyself with ornaments. He's talking to Israel like they're playing the harlot. In verse 43, Then said I unto her that was, was old in adulteries, Will they now commit whoredoms with her, and she with them? So, He's saying, on the same day, if this is Jerusalem, and here's the temple here, on the same day they'd go down here to Tophet, offer their children in the fire to Tophet, and the same day they'd come back and offer me sacrifice up here. I think America does that, don't they? Remember, covetousness is idolatry. Men who call themselves believers go out and covet the world, they want more constantly and at the, the same time they're claiming to believe God and they go to church and offer their ritual, just their presence there. Well, I go to church on Sunday and then I go back to my idolatry and my adultery on Monday. And remember, spiritual adultery is idolatry. Then he says, in verse 17, Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah? Now remember, when he says house of Judah, he's talking about southern Judah, the tribe of Judah and Benjamin is Judah. That's the southern kingdom. That they commit the abominations which they commit here, for they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger, and lo, they put the branch to their nose. When they would go out and do their number two business in the woods, they would wipe their tail with a branch, and he said, this is how it stinks to me. You say, that's awful crude language. Well, tell God that. Therefore will I deal in, mine, in fury. Mine eye will not spare southern Judah. When I bring Nebuchadnezzar in, he's going to annihilate this place. Neither will I have any pity, though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. And let me give you something on those 25 men just a couple of chapters later. Look at chapter 11. Moreover, the Spirit lifted me up. Now, this is God picking up Ezekiel in spirit somewhere around 594, long before Israel is being destroyed, and he's showing him the abominations. Remember, Ezekiel is over here in Babylon. And in the Spirit of the Lord... He's picking Ezekiel up, taking him over here, and showing him what's going on, and showing Ezekiel what he's going to do to Israel. And look here in chapter 11. Moreover, the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the east gate of the Lord's house, which looks eastward. And behold, at the door of the gate, five and twenty men, same 25 men that you find in verse 16 of chapter 8. The ones that are having a sunrise service. And he starts naming them. Among whom I saw Jeoznia, the son of Azur, and Pelatia, the son of Benaiah, princes of the people. Oh, these aren't just... These aren't just some of the Levites. They're princes of the people. They're heads of, the, they're heads of Israel. Princes of the people. Remember, it reminds me when Ezekiel came back, when he came in 457, 
to bring the decrees to assist Israel in supplying all their needs. Remember he said the princes of Israel were chief in this trespass of intermang with these pagan wives. He said it was the princes. He's talking about the leaders of Israel are, are, are leading the people in this apostasy. Then said he unto me, Son of man, these are the men that devise mischief. These are not heathens. These are God's people. These aren't pagan people worshiping other gods. It's Israel. And give wicked counsel in this city which say, it's not near. The end isn't here. God's not coming. Judgment's not going to come on America. It's not happening. It's not near. Let us build houses. This city is the cauldron, and we be the flesh. Therefore, prophesy against them. Prophesy, O son of man. Prophesy against these guys who are lying to Israel and their princes in Israel. And the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me. Would well, you think that's a different Holy Spirit than came in Acts 2? No, it's not. When the Bible says over in John that the Spirit of the Lord wasn't given yet, it meant given to the Gentiles yet. The Spirit of God, which is the truth, was given all through the Old Testament to Israel, fell upon me and said unto me, Speak, thus, speak, thus saith the Lord, Thus have ye said, O house of Israel, for I know the things that came into your mind, every one of them. You have multiplied your slain in the city, and ye have filled the streets thereof with the slain. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, your slain whom ye have laid in the midst of it, they are the flesh, and this city is the cauldron. But I will bring you forth out of the midst of it. Ye have feared the sword, and I will bring a sword upon you, saith the Lord God, and I will bring you out of the midst thereof and deliver you into the hands of strangers, which is Babylon, and then Persia, and then Greece, and then Rome, and will execute judgments among you. Ye shall fall by the sword. Reminds me of Luke twenty-one twenty-four. They shall fall by the edge of the sword, speaking of Israel, and they'll be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem will be trodden down to the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. The beginning of, the, of this prophecy starting right here. Jerusalem is going to fall right here under Ezekiel's prophecy. They shall fall by the sword, and I will judge you in the border of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. This city, Jerusalem, shall not be your calder, neither shall ye be the flesh in the midst thereof, but I will judge you in the borders of Israel, and ye shall know that I am the Lord, for ye have not walked in my statutes, neither executed my judgments, but have done after the manner of the heathen that are round about you. And it came to pass when I prophesied that Pelatiah, the son of Beniah, died. He's one of those 25 men, one of the leaders in that verse 1, isn't he? So he dies. So Pelatiah, the son of Benai, died. Then I fell upon my face and cried with a loud voice, Ah, Lord God, wilt thou make a full end of the remnant of Israel? Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, And the word of the Lord is Jesus, isn't it? Pre-incarnate. Son of man, thy brethren, even thy brethren, the men of thy kindred and all the house of Israel, holy are they... Are they unto whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, Get you far from the Lord unto us? Is this land given a possession? Therefore say, Thus saith the Lord God, Although I have cast them far off among the heathen, Although I have scattered them among the countries, Yet will I be to them as a little sanctuary in the countries where they shall come. Sounds like the church to me. I will be a sanctuary in all the countries where you find them. God says, I'm not going to annihilate Israel because I scatter them. The whole idea of scattering them was because they never kept my, they never kept the sabbatical years. They had a sabbatical year every seven years and they've never kept them. Instead of crop rotation, God would take a year out of every seven and said, let the land lie fallow so all the nutrients will be restored. But they never did that. But he says, I'm not going to make an end to them. Isn't that what he says? What verse was I in there? 17. 17. 
Therefore say, Thus saith the Lord God, I will even gather you. Now notice this. I'm going to scatter you. And in this same chapter, he talks about the regathering. How long does it take, is it taking God to regather? Well, he's going to regather his true spiritual Israel in Acts 2, isn't he? And he's going to bring literal Israel back in the 1900s, 1896, all the way to 1917, liberation of Israel, then the Balfour Declaration in 1920, and then Israel coming back in 1948 to be declared a nation. And assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered. Here's a prophecy of the end of time. In fact, when you go from 16 to 17, you jump 2,600 years, don't you? And you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. And you shall come thither, and they shall make take away all the detestable things there, and all the abominations there from thence. And I will give them one heart... Take away their stony heart, and they'll be pure in heart. And I'll give them a new heart, and we'll put a new spirit within you. And that reminds us of that eighth chapter of Hebrews where he says, I'm going to make a new covenant with my people. I'm going to put my law into their minds and in their hearts will I write it. And he says, I'm going to shed abroad my love in their hearts. And love agape means to walk in the commandments of God. So he's going to write upon flesh and this is a prophecy of the church here. And they shall be my people and I will be their God. Does that include us? Is he our God? Well, yes. Has he written it in our hearts? Yes. But as for them whose heart walketh after the heart of their detestable things, what if I said all that's in the world? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And their abominations, I will recompense their way upon their own heads, saith the Lord God. Then did the cherubims lift up their wings, and the wheels beside them, and the glory of the God of Israel was over them above, and the glory of God went up from the midst of the city of Jerusalem and stood upon the mountain which is in the east side of the city. And afterwards the Spirit took me up and brought me in a vision by the Spirit of God, the truth, the Holy Spirit, into Chaldea. That's Babylon. He's picking me up and taking me back to Babylon, to them of the captivity. He's picking me up from Jerusalem, taking me back to those who are in captivity that were carried away with me, he says. So he took me back to Babylon to those that were in the captivity. So the vision that I had seen went up for me then I spake unto them of the captivity all the things that the Lord had showed me. So he says, God picked me up, took me over here, showed me what was going on, this sunrise service, all these scorpions. I was over here with scorpions over here, and he took me over to see all these men worshiping the sun facing the east, offering their children here, coming back and offering sacrifices to me the same day. Is it any wonder that God scattered? Now, I want us to back up and look at chapter 10. And we see the wheels. We see these wheels finishing up in chapter 11, but I want us to read chapter 10. He's talking about the destruction. Then I looked, and behold, in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubims, there appeared over them, as it were, a sapphire stone, as the appearance of the likeness of a throne. Now, I believe. Now, it says above, notice this. That was the above the heads of the cherubim there appeared over them as it was a sapphire stone, as the appearance of the likeness of the throne. Above the cherubim. Look here. Where were the cherubim in Israel? Isn't, if you notice, in the, in the 11th chapter, Ezekiel 11, Ezekiel is carried from Israel in the vision back over to the captivity, right? So in the 10th chapter, he's seeing things still in Israel, isn't he? Uh, can you see that? He's still in Jerusalem in the 10th chapter. 
in a vision. I don't know whether God carried him bodily or how he carried him. But I, he's in a vision in the 10th chapter. He's not carried back to Babylon to preach to the people in captivity until the 11th chapter. Correct? Yes. This is real simple mathematics. It's not, it's not calculus. It's very simple. So in the 10th chapter, and what he sees, I want to show you what he sees. He sees the throne of God, doesn't he? What is the throne of God? And he sees cherubim. He sees the mercy seat. That's right. God comes down upon the mercy seat. And there's the mercy seat is set up on top of the of the Ark of the Covenant, and the cherubim face each other. And he's seen the throne in the sense that Christ is coming down to sit upon the mercy seat. That's what he's seeing here. And he spake unto the man clothed with linen. Who is that? That's the man in the ninth chapter. The man that's clothed with linen in verse 2, he's got an ink horn, and he's told to go throughout Jerusalem the Lord said unto him in verse 4 of chapter 9, Go throughout the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry. Now notice, the mark only goes on the heads of those who sigh and weep for all the abominations that these men are doing. These are repentant Israelites. The ones that's going to get the mark are repentant, aren't they? They're weeping and crying and they're not going to have any pity for what God's going to do to these people for doing what they're doing. Back to, and he says this, and of course I need to go back and finish up the mark. The mark. When you get into Revelation, the word mark is the word karagma. And it is a derivative of character, C-H-A-R-A-K-T-E-R. And that is the derivative of Karox. Karox is a, is a stake, or it is a rampart. A rampart is a, is a trench that's built around an army that, that is set inside of a border or a boundary. A boundary. And we'll even get into that. Now, that's the word mark or the mark of the beast, and we have a mark on us, and that's God's seal. And I'm going to go back to that man with the ink horn probably next week because I want to finish up. I don't believe that God would put all these words in a book and say, well, I've got, I've got Davy Cross in Luke 9, 23. So therefore, there's no need to read any other verses on the Daily Cross, right? See, I don't believe that. I don't believe that he... Joe, you know, let's just talk about the mark of the beast in, in Revelation 13, chapter, and we'll forget everywhere else it says mark. Let's don't do that. This is what I think is wrong with the preachers. They think all those verses were put there so you can only use one of them. You understand what I'm saying? Let's don't look at all the other verses. Well, if you got, if Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Well, you got take, deny, follow. Well, those are all imperative moods and an arrow, A-I-R-O, and aparnaomai is the word deny. And then you've got to follow akulotheo, A-K-O-U-L-O-T-H-E-O, to be in the same way with. There's something missing there that you get in Luke 14, 27. In Luke 14, 27, it says... If you don't bear your cross, take your cross, which you're commanded, 
You cannot, 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 cannot be my disciple and you can't learn. If you can't learn, you can't obey. If you can't obey, that's faith. Faith has to be obeyed. So therefore, you don't have any faith. You don't find the statement in Luke 14, 27 and Luke 9, 23. And you don't find in Luke 9, 23, you don't find that in Luke 14, 27. It takes both of them. And all the other verses that talk about a daily cross. And it speaks of men hate the cross of Christ because their God is their belly. In the third chapter of Philippians, well, what does that mean? It certainly means a whole lot more. Their God, the reason they don't like this daily cross is that God is their belly. The belly was the seat of all sensual desires, and that's an Epicurean term. You mean you don't need all the verses on a daily cross? I believe we need all the verses on every given subject. That's why on Sunday night, I'm going through every time the word deceived is mentioned in the Bible. And we've gone through all the words planos and planeo and planetes and... and uh, Paneo, we've gone through all those verses. Now we're going to go through apate and apatao and exapatao and get all the verses. When you get all the verses, if you concentrate on this as we go through it, you're going, oh me. You just want to go, whoa. See, I don't believe that God gives us a bunch of verses so we can use one of them. I believe we really need to study thoroughly, don't we? I believe that. I don't know what you believe, but that's why people say Jim Brown repeats himself. What do you think Ezekiel's saying here? The same thing Jeremiah said from all 51 chapters, 52 chapters of Jeremiah. He's saying the same thing that Isaiah's saying through every chapter. He said everything that Hosea and Joel and Amos is saying. That judgment's going to come on Israel because they went after Baal of the Grove and Shemash and Molech and Isis and Osiris and Remen and all the rest of those sun and tree gods, which was Christmas. When people say, you're saying the same thing. Well, take it up with God. How ridiculous. You can't preach Old Testament without saying the same thing over and over and over and over. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. I told you not to do that. I'm going to spank you. What are you getting mad at me? Because God repeats himself. Have you noticed everything Ezekiel is saying about God? Saying, I'm going to destroy Israel. You're going after these gods. You're having sunrise services. You're following these scorpions. <clears throat> that ought to be something. It ought to say something. And he, so he sees a throne above the cherubim. I believe he sees the whole picture of Christ coming down from this kind of glory cloud or from the fire by night and sitting here on the mercy seat which is above the cherubim. I believe he's, all of this is talking about what Israel's doing there, isn't it? And he spake unto the, the man clothed with linen and said, Go in between the wheels, even under the cherub, and fill thine hand with the coals of fire, with the coals of fire, from between the cherubim, and scatter them over the city, and he went in in my sight. What in the world is that talking about? This is very figurative language. If this were the Ark of the Covenant, the writers tell us that... Let me make this larger. They tell us that... That this altar of incense was right here. They had this... The fire... The fire that had to be taken in... There was, a, there was a censer. We don't know exactly what it was shaped like. And they had to pick up. It was a golden censer. You'll find that golden censer in Revelation, the 8th chapter. Spiritual, the spiritual picture over here. And it's a golden censer. They picked up fire. 
from the altar here. And the writers say they brought this fire in and they set it between, if this was the censer, they set it between the cherubim. And God is figuratively telling Ezekiel, take this, these coals from this and take them and sprinkle them out over Jerusalem as though this is not going to be a sweet-smelling savor to God any longer, that God's going to scatter this fire because of Israel's wickedness, and it's going to be a picture of judgment upon Israel. This is very figurative language. From between the cherubim, and scattered them over the city, and he went in my sight. Now the cherubim stood on the right side of the house, when the man went in, and the cloud filled the inner court. The cloud filled the inner court. It was inner court here because this is the inner house. And when they brought the fire in, it had to, it had to cover this in here because if the high priest came in here and he looked up and saw God sitting on the throne, God would strike him dead. Keep your head down. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house, and the house was filled with the cloud, and the court was filled with the brightness of the Lord's glory. Now what is the glory of the Lord? The brightness of his glory was Jesus there in the first chapter of Hebrews. And the sound of the cherubim's wings was heard over even unto the outer court as the voice of the Almighty God when he speaketh. I do not know what that is. I believe it's some figurative language of these cherubim. You had two cherubim inside the, in, that were woven in the veil, and you had one on each end of the ark. Now we know, according to these words here, that this has to do with the censer, that it has to do with the throne of God, which is the Ark of the Covenant. And it came to pass that when he commanded the man clothed with linen, saying, Take fire from between the wheels, from between the cherubim. Now, this word wheel here is the word gal gal. It means a whirlwind. From between the cherubims, then he went in and stood between the wheels, and one cherub stretched forth his hand from between the cherubims in the fire that was between the cherubims and took thereof and put it into the hands of him that was clothed with linen. So if this is a man that's clothed with linen, this is evidently some kind of angel of the Lord or some representative of God. You've got to realize this is not a literal language. This is very allegorical language. Is there actually a man going to go around marking everybody with a literal ink pen. No. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about the same thing as those men who are going to mark, or those four angels are going to mark the men of God in the seventh chapter of Revelation. Well, is there a literal four angels going to run around marking people on the forehead and the hand? No. This is very figurative. Am I out of time? Oh, man. One cherub stretched forth his hand from between the cherubims and the fire that was between the cherubims and took thereof and put it into the hands of him that was clothed with linen. And he took it and went out. And there appeared in the cherubims the form of a man's hand under their wings. And I looked and behold the four wheels by the cherubims, one wheel by one cherub, another wheel by another cherub. Now I don't know whether this is wheels in the sense. Some of those... I've seen pictures of some of them, and some of the cherubim, if it was a bull's head, they had wheels on them as the legs. I don't know if it's talking about those wheels or what it's talking about, to be honest with you. But I do believe that this is a picture of what's happening in Israel with the Ark of the Covenant, and you had these cherubim. Now, I was looking at one of the words wheels, and it's not the same thing as wheels and wheels. I'll have to go back 
and look at that again. And there appeared in the cherubim the form of a man's hand under the wings. Now remember, the wheels and the wheels, the cherubim were also on the sides of the, on the sides of the chariots. Remember that? When I looked and behold, the four wheels by the cherubim, one wheel by one cherub, another wheel by another cherub, and the appearance of the wheels was as the color of barrel stone. I've run out of time. I'm going to have to come back to this. And he's talking about the four faces. Now remember about the four faces. When you get down to verse 14, everyone had four faces. The, and these were what's on side the chariots. You've got to separate the cherub. Let me just say this. Separate the cherubim on the ends of the Ark of the Covenant in the veil from those cherubim that were on the sides of those chariots. They had those cherubim that have a line here like this. Or they'd have uh, some form of that, those Assyrian cherub. You had the cherubim here in the veil, and you had them on the sides of those chariots as they came in to uh, destroy Israel. I've run out of time right in the middle of this, and I wrestle with some of this myself. I guess you can see that. But the way I'll evaluate this is I'll keep defining you got to keep the cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant, on the veils, separated. When he gets back to the cherubim having these four faces, then you're going to back to the... You move from the cherubim in the temple to the cherubim on the wheels, of, uh, on the, uh, the Babylonian war chariots. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. I'll come back to this and see if we can't wind this chapter up. Father, thank you for truth. Cause us to continue this work. Strengthen the sheep. Open up this message to us. God will praise you for everything. Lead us to elect in Christ's name. Amen. I feel like I just halfway got through that and there was a lot of things to say on it. Huh? Oh, I just had to cut it off. There's a lot of stuff there. I didn't even get to where I wanted to go. I was headed for some other things. Heavy stuff. Shadow? Yeah, but then I won't get out. The shepherd. Yeah, she <laughs>